Hi, this is Craig Goldie. You know me best for Dio and Dio Disciples, and now Dream Child. And you're listening to Focus on Metal. Hey, Metalhead, Scott Thompson here, welcoming you to another episode of that which we like to call Focus on Metal. So I don't say it enough, but I'm going to say it right now. Thank you very much for continuing to listen to us for the past, uh, what, about 12 years now, as uh, this one marks episode 576 for us. If uh, if you're new, or you're just kind of catching up, uh, last week had another great uh, segment of our Iron Maiden going through the catalog, three albums at a time deal. So go back and check that one out. But this week, keeping in the vein of October, and it's a very loose vein, is the scary tale of David Glenn Isley and the band that came after Jeffrey Dirty White Boy. Yes, it's a scary tale of the whims and fancies of the music business. A little real-life horror story for you for October. Hell, I'll even be slightly trendy here and say that it's for Rocktober. So if you're not familiar, let me give you just a quick gist of the whole situation. And that is that a lot of you people probably know David Glenn Isley as the voice of Jeffrey. It's probably one of the things he's best known for. But uh, after that band, um, I'll call it quote unquote dissolved. And he talks a little bit about what actually happened in this week's episode. Um, He went on and uh, he ended up joining a band with Earl Slick called Dirty White Boy. And that uh, first album from them, Bad Reputation, is, uh, I guess the best way to say it, is it died on the vine while they were touring in Europe. So the main reason that Richie reached out to David was to talk about Dirty White Boy and Bad Reputation and all the crap that went on, the good stuff and a lot of the bad stuff with that album, get a little bit of Jafria past history, some of the segue between those bands, what David's done since, just, you know, kind of all that usual good stuff. And this is a long interview, folks. We're talking about 90 minutes of good stuff with David, very candid, and uh, he's got lots of stories, talks about touring with Foreigner, talks about all the crap that happened with them, touring just for a short period of time with Deep Purple. If you want to hear a great impression of John Kalodner, listen to this episode. David does a great one. And I sorely wish that you could have heard some of the -the off-the-record stories that David told as well. But, uh, you know, we're not one of those shows that goes with clickbait and all that good stuff. So for things where David said, hey, this is for your uh, ears only, or this one is, uh, just keep this one out of print. We heeded all of those wishes and anything that he decided that uh, he didn't want us to air, or right from the get-go when he was talking about it, he was like, yeah, not for air. Chop that out. I only wish you guys could have heard some of that great stuff. But uh, again, we got to respect the artists we have on the show. And, uh, you know, David is certainly worthy of our respect. And David, if you're listening, I just got to say for me to you, the mural story, freaking priceless. So if you don't mind digging into the bowels of rock and roll history and kind of, you know, tearing up those dirty rocks and seeing what's crawling underneath it, then I urge you to listen to this week's show because uh, David does some no holds barred. Again, great stories, great recollections, cautionary tale about things that can happen with record companies. Although nowadays, what record companies are really freaking left? But anyways, with all that, as I said before, this one is going to be a long one. Thanks for listening, and I'm going to turn it over to vocalist extraordinaire, David Glenn Isley. Hello. Hello, Rich. How are you? Hey, David. How are you doing? I'm doing okay, man. It's been a crazy week, and I just had an AC guy out here. It's been hotter than hell again. Welcome to L.A. L.A. So, yeah. Yeah. So I'm um, yeah. I'm just outside of Boston. Ah, okay. That, that's great. How's your weather out there? Getting, cooling down and stuff? Yeah, it's about, uh, I think today it's about 55. Oh, you lucky bastard. <laughs> <laughs> You lucky bastard! Yeah, but I'm originally I'm originally from further across. I'm I'm, I'm from Ireland. Oh. oh no, I can tell. I can tell you. I was just going to say you sound yeah. Irish. Yeah, I am. I'm going. Yeah. I'm actually going home uh, 
in a week and a half. I haven't been home in five years. Oh, uh, it'll be good, man. Looking, we have some good friends in Ireland and uh, in Dublin, and then our, all of our in-laws and my co- daughter's cousins and all that are all in London. So it's English, Irish, and I'm, I'm from Irish descent too, so nice. Irish, Swiss descent. Okay, um, nice. I've never interviewed you before. A, a, a drunk guy on a... Hmm? A drunk guy on a, on a, on a, on a mountainside. <laughs> <laughs> so, Go figure it out. Yeah. So, you know. so I've never interviewed you before. I've interviewed people you've worked with, and, and I have yeah, interviewed yeah. Bo Hill, which I'm sure we're going to get into. Um, do, <laughs> yeah, do, you, do, you get asked, do you get asked a lot about the Dirty White Boy record? No, I really don't, and the reason being cut and dry, and you've probably heard it before from the other guys. Um when we when we signed that deal, we signed a pretty lucrative deal, and it, I call it the Dick Asher regime of Polygram, which was at the time it was Bon Jovi, it was Def Leppard, it was uh, Tears for Fears, it was you know it was like it was like you know all these you know the, the, they were major at, at, at that point at that point, and it was so it was Dick's. So as soon as we signed. Within six months of signing, I mean, we were in the studio, got the got the record done, and they, for some unforeseen reason, they sent us to Europe first. They sent us immediately out onto the road, and we went straight to um, to London. We played the Marquee, and then we played the big ones: Birmingham, Wembley. All you know, we we were, we were just out and about and then we took the ferry and went over to Europe and you know banged out every friggin city in Europe and um, we ended up in Stockholm and uh, I remember distinctly I remember the promoter I can't do a Swedish accent but uh, he just came backstage they, a couple of them came backstage while we were changing we were done and he says oh man might as well not even go home there's no record company and we said, well, what are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and it was like we had, like, full-page ads on the back of, like, circus, you know, all the magazines. It was like full-page ads of the band and all that, you know, in America. The, the coming out, the band coming out, the, the release coming out in March of 1990, I guess. It would have been 90 or 91. And... Um, <laughs> and he, he was dead right. We came home, and uh, Billy Eckstein, you know, the jazz musician, you know, mm-hmm. I was real, real good friends with his daughter and stuff like that, uh, Cece. And uh, we came home, and there was no, there, there was literally no record rock and roll department at all. If we had to go talk to somebody, we talked to, to Billy or somebody up in the R&B section you know, department. And it was like, What's going on? So they they shipped, an, it was like an obligatory by contract. Um, maybe they shipped like 75, maybe 10,000 at the top. They shipped that many records out throughout the whole United States. And there was no press other than the pre-press, you know, because you always do it like a couple months in advance. Mm-hmm. And we were, com- we were coming home at, you know, like, right after Thanksgiving, early December, into the new year. So that's when those magazines all hit the rack, and there there was no record. Wow. (laughs) Oh, yeah, it was was ridiculous. Mm. I want to go a little bit back before the Dirty White Boy band formed. And you said in interviews when you did that record that you almost signed a solo album deal, but things didn't work out. Uh, Can you remember why they didn't work out? Well, I was still, it was like, or, or, you know, um, to dis, not dispute, but to just disagree with Jane and all of that House of Lords nonsense, which was literal press nonsense that I think Jane, you know, that, that was his explanation. Because we had already gone in and demoed a bunch of stuff that Greg and I had written. And, you know, and Lanny at the time. You know, because basically House of Lords was basically 
the third Javria record with another singer. And I have nothing against James. James could sing her, you know. But um, what happened was, is Greg and I had a meeting at Camel, which was Camel MCA, which we shared the label. It was only us and Night Ranger. We, had a, we literally had a meeting with Bruce Bird, who was the president, God rest his soul. But, uh, and we just looked at each other. And we just said, that we'd already demoed all this stuff, you know, and uh, which... A third of the House of Lords record, a little, little over a third of it, is my stuff on that record. We had already demoed it, and then some, there was a hitch with Camel and MCA, I believe. And what happened was the solo record was conceivably going to come out with Bruce being being Bruce Bird and Camel. And uh, subsequently, Camel went under. They were done. They were basically done, or at least, and Greg and I looked at each other. I'll never forget it. We were sitting at his, Bruce's desk, and we just said, you know, I guess we've, you know, we've really come to the end of the rope with us. We're sort of done, you know. And in the meantime, I think probably... Greg was already courting, or Gene was already courting Greg, and Greg was already courting Gene, and we'll put this thing together, and it'll be like blah, 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 you know, this, that, and the other. And at the same time, ironically enough, at the same time, I went down to some underground, you know, like, punk record listening party. I was on my motorcycle. I was on my barley. And Kenny Richards was there. And he spotted me, and he knew who I was. And he says, hey, man, you know, Kenny was crazy. God rest his soul. And he was going, you know, he's chomping on the filter of a Marlboro. And he's saying, listen, listen, man, I'm putting this band together with Slick. You know, Earl Slick? And I go, yeah, yeah, I know Earl Slick. I worked with him back in 1980. And uh, he goes, well, I'll put this thing together. Why don't you go over to the studio tonight? Now, this is all, all at the same time. House of Lords is being constructed. I'm on my bike, I see Kenny, I go down to the studio, and there's a bunch of guys auditioning in there as a singer for that, for what became Dirty Report. And I was, I just sat there quietly, I just went into the office, and then I came out, and they gave me a few tracks, and I sat down, I jotted out some ideas real quick, and I sang, and Slick said, that's it. Kenny said, that's it, we're, we're done, you want to join? And I said, yeah. Because <laughs> I love Slick. I just love him, you know. And Kenny was, was the character of all characters. They should have built a, character, a cartoon around him. <laughs> so that was that. So when everybody, you know, when there's this thing like, yeah, well, we had to fire the singer. And, uh, <laughs> and what you did is you virtually put the next just read record out and, and changed the face. You know, it was like, it was insanity. But, um, you know, and, and subsequently in the last, you know, over the years, Greg has called me on several occasions, trying to, you know, and he's a very successful businessman, as you know. Yeah. You know, and he has been for a long time now. So he doesn't need the money and he doesn't need to do this non you know, stuff. And he's just said, man, I'm so sorry things went down the way they did. And I should have never done it. And we should have had. The, you know, the, the next Jeffrey record, we could have gotten a label anywhere, and uh, we should have just done it. And Gene just twisted my arm, he just talked me into it. You know, and he, they had a history from Kiss and Angel, and, you know, Greg just went for it. And that's fine, I don't fault him for it. I say, it's okay, I don't, I don't, it's all right. Listen, I landed on my feet, I was in, I was in one of trouble, we had more fun playing in Dirty White Boy than I did in Jafria, really, because there was a lot of intertension in Jafria. In Dirty White Boy, there was nothing but just like, let's just go rock, you know. Mm. Let's just go, you know, I mean, I've regret. Unfortunately, Kenny's got the majority of them probably in his grave with him. But the roadies used to, on cassettes back then, used to tape all the shows. And that record is, take, ING out. That record was a wreck compared to what we really sounded like on, you know, live. We were, it was like a freight train from hell. We were hearing these cassettes over at Kenny's house and just going, that's not us. This is on a cassette recorder. 
you know, I've got, I've got about six or seven of them, you know, from Berlin, from, you know, um, Offenbach, from, you know, wherever. They're all primarily from Germany. Mm. But they were just like, well, who the fuck is that? <laughs> that's, not, that's not us. That's not us. <laughs> and, and I don't want to go on. I'll let you ask another question. But I have an interesting story about the, the beginning of that whole putting of that record and writing of those songs together. And uh, it's something that nobody knows. I mean, you know, some people might, but most people don't know. I used to play ball, softball. Well, I still do. Um, not as much, but we had rock and roll teams and stuff and all, you know, this and that. And not necessarily just musicians, but they were hardcore games. I mean, we went out for blood, you know, we played hard. And some guys, most, the only guys that could play were guys that knew how to play the game. And Neil Geraldo was one of them. And Neil was a big fan of Slick's. And Slick was, was not a big fan of anybody's. Slick was a big fan of Neil's. And I'll never forget going, driving down, Slicky and I driving down to Malibu and meeting and Neil and Slick and I met at a Starbucks down there near, you know, right past Pepperdine. And uh, Neil came out to the rehearsals and Slick was just like a kid in a candy store. He was going, oh my God, man, I'm gonna, he can play he can play guitar on it. We'll have him co-produce it with us. He's, he's the guy. He is the guy we want. And I'm going... No shit. I mean, I love this cat. He, he fits right into what we what we want to do. You know, he's a different player than Slick, but he's the same deal. He's the real thing. You know, it's not Flash and, you know, a gazillion notes a minute and all mm -hmm. that kind of crap. You know, and anyway, so we were, we were hell bent that that was it. Neil was going to co-produce, and at the time, Danny Goldberg was managing us. Danny, who ended up being the president of Atlantic, and then he went on to, I think he's retired, I don't know. But anyway, Bo, coming from, you know, Winger and Warrant, and, you know, God bless them, they're great, they all, they sold good records and, you know, and stuff like that. But we, I mean, between you, me, and the lamppost, we hated their records. Just, they were not our taste. Right down the line, all four of us was like, no, 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 it's just, it's, that's like that's sugar pop rock, you know, but that's not what we're all about. It's fine, you know, and it's a lot of people like it, but we don't want to, sure as hell don't want to sound like that, you know. Well, Bo had his way of doing it. He'd come off like, you know, platinum records and all this kind of stuff, and he wine and dined. Polygram and Danny Goldberg, it must have cost him a hundred grand in lunches. He says, I need a band. And he literally said, I need a band like this to show that I have another, that I can turn the corner, that I can, you know, this, I can play, you know, I can, I have a blues sense. I have this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. Well, so they overruled Neil. So Neil was out of the picture and we were pretty disappointed and we just said, well, okay, well, we'll go to the studio and hope for the best. And I can't tell you, I can't tell you how many times I had to literally bring Slick back and what, he'd walk up. <laughs> he'd walk up. The methods that Bo was using were so, not alien to Slick, but they were so against his grain. It was like, just leave me the fuck alone and let me play, you know. Don't do this. Don't be analytical. Put your telescope and microscope away and just just pull her off. Just go away. And I'd have to literally go out in the street, pull him out of his Jeep and say, dude, come on, man. Let's just try to get through the day. And that's how that whole record came together. And then the end mixes were just so bad that we had to take him to Woodstock with Thompson Barbiero, who Slick knew from dancing in the streets with Bowie and Jagger. And they tried to take, <laughs> they tried to take the multi-tracks and try to make heads and tails of them and try to make some kind of 
change. So it, it you know, to, to, to pull it more into our, where we wanted it to be, which is near impossible because the performances are already there or the way it went down on tape is already there. And I remember Kenny yelling and screaming, I can't hear my fucking hi-hat. <laughs> Turn my fucking hi-hat up. Jesus Christ, it's a rock and roll band. You know, and if you listen to the Winger Warrant records, you can't even hear a hi-hat. Mm. You can barely hear a cymbal. Once in a while, you hear a cymbal crash. You know, I'm talking about the early stuff. And that's fine. It's radio-friendly. They don't care, you know. But we did. We cared. So, I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a bitch. It was really a, a, a drag. Mm. So, the long and short of it is, we, it was bad timing. So, by the time we got back home, uh, there literally was no big, you know, rock and roll. That polygram was the place to be. Period. End of story. Dick Asher. We got signed on a phone call, and I can't. I'm trying to remember his name, but he came. He came down to one rehearsal, and he called Dick up, and he said, "Sign these guys." And we looked at each other, and we went, "Wait, what, what do you mean?" Danny came down. And he says, "Okay, you're on polygram." And we said, "What do you mean? We haven't even auditioned for." Anybody, but I think his last name was McBride, something like that, like Ron McBride or something. He was like an underwing of dicks. And that was it. We were signed. So, you know, that's how that whole thing went down. House of Lords did their thing, you know, and we basically were dead in the water in America. But we, you know, <laughs> it was funny it took when we got there because mm. MCA such a pathetic fucking label <laughs> when we Jeffrey was out you know we did all the states with four all the states with deep deep purple you know the real bands yeah and uh, 20,000 seaters 30,000 seaters every night you know and uh, they we would go they would send us off to record stores you know to, to like supposedly for signings and they were like two two weeks behind getting the records into the towns that we were supposed to be playing in. <laughs> so we go, we get to Charlotte, you know, to uh, play the show that night. And let's say hypothetically we'd be sent out to the store. <laughs> They'd have like two records in the store. <laughs> I mean, that's how pathetic it was. Wow. It was just unbelievable. So it, everybody had a sour taste in their mouth with that whole thing. By the time we got to Japan headlining, you know, the band was coming apart at the seams, you know, because Greg was, you know, he was trying to run the show and he was opening his mouth at the wrong time with the wrong people. And it got back to Irving, who was the president at the time. And, uh, and when Lonely and Love came out, which entered the charts 20 slots higher than Call of the Heart, it was on the charts for about a week and then the news got hit Irving and he just literally like Lily Tomlin and laughing, he just pulled the cord right out of right out of the right out of the you know, the uh, patch patch bay. Yeah. Just said that's fuck them. That's it. <laughs> I've had heard enough. Because he you know, he was insulted. Somebody insulted him. Mm. So that's yeah. how that all went down. I got a but, couple, uh, I got a couple of questions on some of the things you've already sure. brought up there. I'd go in, get a little bit more detail on it. Um, yeah. How 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 when did you find out that Greg was going to use the songs on the debut House of Lords album, and how did you feel about? It? I, I didn't. I did not know until the record came out, and then somebody, you know, I you know we'd done two records, we'd been around, you know. Somebody, if you look at that House of Lords record, my last name is misspelled wrong. They left the E off. So it's like the Isley Brothers. Like I was one of the Isley Brothers. Hmm. It says David Glenn, I-S-L-E-Y. And I was like, oh, I just was like, yeah, this has got to be Gene. It can't be, it can't, Greg couldn't stoop that low. You know, that, that that's a big typo. I mean, that that's like a big typo. <laughs> and I think, <laughs> so, if, if, if you can correct me, but... I think the House of Lords record was the first one on his label. So, yeah. So you'd think yeah, that would have been was, like proofread and 100% accurate. and. Oh, yeah, you would think anyway. Yeah. That he'd have it totally. Like, you know, I mean, 
all of your freedom fans, the first thing they'd be doing is grabbing that record and seeing what's going on, you know, or what it's going to sound like. And Greg told, and I, this is straight from the horse's mouth, he said, I want you to, to inflect every nuance that you possibly can muster up that Dave did on these original demos. And the original demos are on my Lost Tapes record mm. from Frontiers. You can hear all four or five songs, maybe short of one of them, on my Lost Tapes, which are the demos. They weren't the final big things. They were the demos for the third Jeffrey record. And uh, they ended up on the House of Lords record. <laughs> you know, so it's like, this is a lot of weird stuff was going on in the background, you know. So, you know, I'm not going to point fingers at anybody, but I, I have an inkling of, of what was going on. Mm. And, uh, you know, I don't care. I mean, it's like, you know, I had the Bernie White Party situation, and it, they were almost like literally simultaneous. You know, I mean, the House of Lords might have gotten uh, a weak jump on me before I ran into Kane. You know, yeah. But I knew something was going to happen. I knew I was going to land somewhere. Yeah. And I didn't want to be in that nightmare anymore, anyway. And Greg and I had already made sort of like peace with it. We kind of said, "Hey, Bruce, you know, hey, because you know, we both knew in our heads this label sucks. You know, and it's like, why are we going to bother? Yeah. And now, now this the camel end of it, you know, is having troubles with MCA because of Irving. So. What are they going to do? You know, they need a distributor. They need somebody to distribute a third Jeffrey record. Well, they didn't have one. They were ready to go under. I think the only thing that kept them afloat was maybe a couple more Night Ranger records. That was it. And the Night Ranger was gone. Yeah, they were gone, I think, in 88, 89? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's exactly when Dirty White Boy came out. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it all, it all, if you look at it in a timeline, it all, what I'm telling you, it all fits into a slot, you know. And the coolest thing with, with Dirty White Boys, we were, we had just arrived, it was late at night in Germany, at, uh, in, in, in Berlin. No, in Hamburg, matter of fact. We checked into our hotels, we maybe had a drink or two, and we all went to bed. And then all of a sudden it sounded like World War Three. And it was the night of unification. Oh, wow. And we were on this beautiful town square. The hotel was a Hyatt. And it was on this town square. And the place was going berserk. And we, we were scared. People were running out into the hallways. They didn't know what the hell was going on. And then people started yelling unification in German. Unification, unification. The wall, the wall. It's coming out. And we all went, oh, my God. You know, we're, we're sitting in history, you know. And the next day, we all were, like, on our way to Hard Luck Chucks, we used to call it. You know, Checkpoint Charlotte. Mm. <laughs> we called it Hard Luck Chucks. <laughs> you know, we got there, we got little pieces of the wall and broken pieces of the sticks that came down. And, you know, it was, it was, it was crazy. It was crazy. But unfortunately, we came home to... <laughs> we had to try to figure out how to become an R&B band real quick <laughs> and we just <laughs> and we decided not to yeah. it was ridiculous um, you, you mentioned also David that there was other singers that tried out for Dirty White Boy before you um, any na- any names that I might know you know what There's, I'm trying to remember that you know that far back there was one that I knew of, that I recognized, and he was short, a short fella, and a good singer, you know. But I, I you know, if I remember his name, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll let you know. So at the time I'm mixing this, we still hadn't heard back from David as far as who that guy was, and you know, he maybe he forgot that he was going to try to remember. Who knows? It would have been uh, quite hilarious if he came back and said. Ronnie James Dio, because, of course, obviously, when he starts talking about black hair and short, that was the first thing that popped into my head. But, uh, yeah, it's kind of weird for the timeline. But if David does reach back out to Richie and uh, drops who that was, 
I will certainly drop it into the show notes at focusonmetalpod.com. But I can't remember his name, but I wouldn't want to, you know, you know, not that it would embarrass him at this point in his life, assuming he's even alive. But I can't remember his name, but I remember he was the only one that I looked at and went, or even noticed, and just out of the corner of my eye, I went, oh, yeah, he's, he's pretty good. He, mm. he's, he's, good singer. he's a good singer, you know. Mm. It, was like a, it was like a Joe Lynn Turner kind of sort of vibe. Mm. You know, he had the black, black hair, and he was, and he wasn't very tall, and, uh, but he wasn't Joe. But, he, you know, he did his thing, and I just, he kind of said, what do you want to say? I said, no, 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 let, let, let these guys have already been booked. Let them all get done, and then I'll finish. And I'll just do my thing, and then you guys take her to leave it, you know. Because okay. I loved the tracks. The tracks were like, they were right up my alley. I mean, the tracks were, the tracks, put it this way, the tracks that they had laid John Burdell and Dane... Uh, Dwayne Barron? Dwayne Barron. They were producing the demo the demo tracks. Okay? And these things were like... They were jumping out of the speakers. And I'm talking about Badlands. I'm talking about what became what became Badlands after I got done with it. And what became uh, You Give Me Love. I think it was like three tunes. And then one that didn't go on the record called um it's on my lost tapes oh, what the hell is it called um I'll, I'll remember i'll shoot it to you it was but it's 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 there's like on the, on the lost tapes record there's you can tell that you're free of stuff you can tell what was the dirty white boy stuff because it's all kind of like itemized there's like four dirty white boy songs that just shit on the record i mean just 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 crap all over it and uh, I remember them, remember Dwayne and John trying to do these meticulous mixes, and we heard them. Slick and I heard them. You know, Slick was a lot more yeah in New York. You know, hey, you know. And he, he, he we both listened and we said, man, it just sounds flat. <laughs> so Dwayne wasn't there one night, and we just looked at John. God bless him, talented guy. Yeah. And we just said, Johnny. Just take the faders and just ram them. Just ram them up. I don't care. Just where the slots end, that's where the fader should be. Just ram them up. And he literally basically did that. And they just, they're just killer. They just, I mean, if you take one of the dirty white boy ones that I just mentioned off the lost tapes and put it up against the record version, the Bow Hill version, You'll just, you'll fall off your chair. you just go, oh my God. Hmm. <laughs> oh my God. Bo didn't have a clue what these guys were all about. I mean, not a clue. You know, so, you know, and it, it, so it ended up on a bad note as far as we spent Thanksgiving in New York and Woodstock. And that was good up in Bearsville, you know, Dylan, the band, all these people, you know, and we're, we're trying to mix this shit in that studio which was that was cool in itself but um the end result was you know thompson barbero they could only do so much and it's like basically trying to undo a bandage that had been put on improperly so the sore underneath it was already kind of getting you know messed up so they tried to put whatever kind of band-aids they knew how to put on onto that record and still a lot of people you know dig it and they don't know the difference but if they take if they if they were to take the lost tapes album and then take those few comparisons they'd be astonished they'd just go wow somebody missed the boat on this record boy Mm. on the real on the real record you know, yeah. which shouldn't be the real record at all. The real record should have been with freaking Neil. Yeah. It should have been with Slicky and Neil playing guitars, Neil, you know, manning the helm, and uh, and us just having a great time, you know. Yeah. Because Neil's a great guy, and he's a freaking great player, and he's a great producer. 
all in his all in his own right. You know. So Dan Pat and I used to have our hair done by the same guy. <laughs> That's how I met them. It was hilarious. Yeah. You know. So so D- yeah. David, tell me about the first time you met Bo Hill. Did he did he go to dinner with the band and say, "Look, this is what sort of record I want," and you were able to discuss it? With <laughs> no, him? no, 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 no. that? No. When we first, I gotta try to remember. I think we met up. I think Slick and I and Bo met up at the place called the Glen Deli, which is up in Beverly Hills. It's a it's a de- it's a deli. It's like a high end deli. And Bo took us to lunch, you know, and also another wine and cheeser. And this is before, <laughs> before, you know, and we had already done the whole dog and pony, not dog and pony, but we had already met with Neil. So we knew what we wanted. But, you know, Danny was insistent, Goldberg, that we meet with Bo. So we met with Bo. He took us to lunch and he says, you know, he said the same thing, same story. I need you guys. I need you guys worse than you need me. I need you guys, you know, and he was, he was doing that whole spiel, you know, he's coming out. We're not coming off of a million double platinum, single platinum records. He is. So his bullshit of, I need you more than you need me was like, that went in one ear and right out the other. And we just sat there, had our free lunch and, uh, looked at each other and went, we both just get, what do you think? And we said, well, we'd, we'd, we'd rather do this thing with Neil. There's no two ways about it. We'd rather do it with Neil because we know what it's going to end up sounding like. It's going to sound like John and Dwayne, on, you know, on steroids. It's going to be huge, you know, and... Uh, Dan and they just basically the record company because of money because of numbers they overruled us and they said no we're going to do it with Bo so we just kind of bit our tongues and went well let's just you know go and do it with open ears and and it was the most exhausting time you know it was like day and we're in we're a wrong studio we're in a studio that Paul you know the Enterprise in the Valley which is where Paula Abdul, God bless her, sweetheart, she had just won seven Grammys, and I meet her at the water cooler, and I go, congratulations from last night, that's great, you know, hey, <laughs> cool, you know, and she's just, you know, she's in the other room, and, and I'm thinking to myself, scratching my head, going, what are we doing in this studio that is just maxed out, wall to wall, without board gear, that none of us give a shit about, I mean, I'm not kidding you. Slick, in the, on that record, he used an MXR phase shifter, which you can buy for 79 bucks, and I think an overdrive pedal. That's all he wanted. That's all he needed. And Bo insisted on him pushing, sticking me in this rack and trying to get this sound and trying to, you know, and Slick would just get to the point where he was, you know, going through a pack of Marlboros and he said, I'm out of here. I'm fucking out of here. I'm leaving. You know, and I go, oh God, what am I going to do? You know, and I, I'd run, I'd go out, I'd run into the alley, and I'd drag him back in. I say, Slick, we got to, let's just try to get through it. He goes, this, this is bullshit. He goes, this is bullshit. <laughs> I can't play like this. Nobody's ever asked me to play like this. Bowie's never asked me to play like this. John never asked me to play like this. I could walk in there with a fucking empty beer can and a rubber band. And if they and if I said it works, they'd say, "Okay, cool, play." You know, that's it. D- David, what, was why why is a compromise? Did you not go to the label and say, "Right, why why can't we do the album with with Dwayne Barron and John Pardell then?" Because number one, they at that point they had never even heard. I don't believe they had ever even heard. John and Dwayne's demos. Okay, mm-hmm. they might have. They might have two. Of me and maybe one or two of them might have slipped through the cracks, and they might have heard those. You know, and uh, actually, John Collodner heard them. John heard them because John always was trying to scotch tape me to somebody, and it, whether it be at the end of the day, like for instance, you know who John is. Yes, I do. What he looks like. Yeah, you know, guy looks like a 
dude looks like a lady, you know. So we were rehearsing a potential dead on arrival second Dirty White Boy record for Virgin. And we were rehearsing over at Leeds Studios. Now, right across the little alleyway, when you go into the parking lot, there's a couple little studios, tiny ones. So John calls me up, and he says, listen, Dave, you talk like this. You know, Dave, I, I know you're rehearsing with Dirty White Boy right now, but this is kind of on the sly. When you have a break, I want you to go across the little alleyway. And Peter, you know, Frampton, will be waiting. <laughs> he wants to he wants to meet you because he's heard your voice. He's heard Lazy Crazy, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, he's all this stuff, you know. And he says he wants to talk to you. So I said, oh, okay. So I snuck over there and I went into the little room and there was Pete sitting there. And what the whole crux of it was is Pete and John, probably John mostly, were trying to conjure up a whole new revamp of Humble Pie. Now, my wife used to go to school with Stevie in England, you yeah. know. And uh, my wife is Olivia Hussey, you know, who played Juliet, you know. And so that was back in the London heyday and all that stuff. And they all went to drama school together. So anyway, so I, we, we couldn't have been in there. I couldn't have been in there more than 15, 20 minutes. And we were talking. And he goes, oh, you know, I really I like, I love your voice. I dig it. And this and that. But I go, shit man I saw you guys in 72 with Stevie you know at the Long Beach Arena man you blew my friggin head off I mean you were amazing it was, you know so it was like a complimentary thing it was nice back and forth and then there was like this dead silence I kid you not it was probably the longest 15 seconds of us just you know Pete just kind of leaning on his arm and me just kind of you know picking my ear and uh, we almost both simultaneously said I think I said it first I said Peter, we can't, nobody can do Humble Pie without Pete, without us, Stevie. And he, the, the look on his face was like, he, it just, it was like the sigh, the biggest sigh of relief. He goes, I am so glad you said this first. Hmm. And I said, well, okay. And we both kind of laughed. And, I, and then it was like, we looked at each other and said, well, okay, who, who's going to tell John, you know? And uh, I said, I laughed and I said, well, I guess it's probably going to have to be you. I said, because I, and it, it never happened, you know, and I, you know, I, at that time in my career, I would have, I probably would have done it or at least tried to do it in a heartbeat, you know, because I, I loved Tumble Pie yeah. and I loved Stevie and I, I loved his voice and to be even compared to be in that realm of that edgy you know, raspy shit, you know, it was like, yeah, man, I get, I get this stuff. And Pete knew I got it. You know, that's why I had John, you know, send me over there and, uh, look at each other. And I said, this is, and this is before, you know, this was before bands were, you know, becoming, you know, tribute bands. This was well before that, but it might've been one of the first ones, you know, if we had gone ahead and done it. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad, in retrospect, I'm glad we didn't do it. Because I, I wouldn't, you know, I know Kelly very well. Or not very well, but I know him. We've met several times. And he's a great singer. And he does a great job of doing Lou. You know. And, uh, but, you know, come on. He's kept the music alive. He's he's kept Mick on his feet for years. But it it, it, it really is meaningless. It's like, you know. The audiences are older. They don't care. They just want to hear the songs. But there's no substantial new records, you know, with with Lou and Mick writing, you know. It, so it all make to me. I've just lost so much interest because it just does. It's meaningless. It, it just it, it, it's meaning. It's meaningful to the fans, and the fact that you got to just be on the road all the time to make your to make your mortgage or your rent. Yeah. You know, because you can't make any money with records anymore. Forget mm -hmm. it. Forget it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it it probably would have been one of the forerunners of they're trying to put back Humble Pie together and they got a new singer. 
<laughs> you know, great. Mm. You know, who cares? It's like, okay, well, let's put Zeppelin together. <laughs> we'll just re- we'll just replace Plant. Fuck it, who cares? <laughs> you know, yeah. It's like you don't you don't do it, man. If you got any kind of integrity, mm. you know. So you, 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 it's, yeah. So David, um, you already said that Earl wanted to kill Bo. So tell me about tracking vocals with Bo. Did you want to kill him as well? No, I didn't. You know why? Because he had nothing to say. We did all my vocals. You know, the whole thing was so crazy. We couldn't stay in one studio, one good earthbound, funky studio. So we had to fly to a place called Granny's House. That's a funny story, quick. You'll like it. It, It's in Reno. So Bo and I flew up there to check it out. Strictly to do vocals and a few guitar overdubs. The whole band flies up to Granny's after we've got the basic tracks, which blew. You know, I mean, they, I mean, they weren't bad in the sense of the normal ear hearing them, but they were bad to us. They weren't what they what we wanted, but we had to live with them. So anyway, we get to Granny's house, and it's a it's a Cape Cod cottage house it's been converted downstairs into a full blow studio beautiful and it's got like five bedrooms and the band just lives there okay so i get i got i've got all my shit done it's all math written done i know what i'm gonna do it's just being in shape and just get in there and blow my guts out that's it so when i got in there the only thing that i don't care for doing and i never really did it with with uh Dirty White, I'm with uh, Jafria. I basically, it was two takes at tops. And most of the time it would be one take and it would be a punch-in, maybe one or two punch-ins on ev- and everything I did on both those records. Because I don't like, you know, Bo's a big comper. Well, let's do like 10 versions and then we'll comp it and take mm. the best the and the best and and <laughs> the best love from different tracks. Well, I'm not big on that. So I told him, I said, oh, let's just cut it down. Because a lot of these are screamers, man. And I'm going balls out. So let's cut it down to three three takes. And then we'll cut. And then you and I will come. And he goes, okay, fair enough. So I blow through him. I blow through it. Blow through it again. And I blow through it again. Unless he'd stop me two and say, fuck, man, this is like Bon Scott. This is crazy, man. That, that was literally what he said. He'd say, it's, it's fucking Bon Scott. And he was way off because it didn't sound at all like Bon Scott. <laughs> but that's but that's his rock and roll mentality. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think he probably listened to an ACDC record all the way from front to bottom. Or, you know, so he, he, but I, so I had no qualms at all. There was never a lyric change. There was never like, do this, do that. Why don't you go up there? Why don't you go down there? Nothing. Just I just blew through it. Just blew through it. I just want to ask you a, a little bit about a couple of songs on the record because, in my um, in, dirty white boy. Yeah. So in, in my yeah. in my opinion, all the best songs are in are in the back end. Um, you, you cut out. You cut out there. Didn't yeah. You? All, so all the best songs on the record, in my opinion, are at the back end of it. So I'm thinking Dead Cat Alley, Soul of a Loaded Gun, Badlands. They're, like they're all the best songs, and they're all like at the end of side one, and all on side two. Um, would would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I would agree with it. I would agree with it, and that was another. That was another managerial choice that the bad the bad reputation put it and i can't remember it without looking at it i can't remember the order and those are the songs the ones you just mentioned those in fact dead cat alley we never even did live we never even did it why i don't know we should have but um soul of a load of gun i think we did live the only reason i don't know i don't because i've had a Hammond brought in, and I played Hammond on Soul because I said, "Sucky, we need a we need a Hammond on this." And he goes, "Really?" I said, "Yeah, let's let's get a Hammond ordered." I mean, Bose Bose like money's no no object, so get him get him to get a fucking Hammond in here, and I'll put a Hammond part on it. 
you know, and Soul of a Loaded Gun was a, was one of my favorite tunes on the record. Oh yeah, and it, and it was before. If you listen to the cadence of that verse, it was before Def Leppard had Sugar on Me. I think. No, that was. I, mean, 80, I didn't have it. That was eighty seven. Uh, Def Leppard. Sugar. Album. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then it might have been. It might have been my my bad. Uh, just you know. I, you know, subconsciously just getting that cadence out, but it was they're, they're similar in the verse cadences. But um, so I tip my hat to Joe. So, <laughs> but yeah, and Bad Badlands went was always a killer. They loved it. And another one that that, that you didn't mention that live people loved it. And in fact. A lot of the magazines, now you can mind you, this was all European magazines stuff at the time. They would say that the band became more real when Dave put on his Telecaster. When he strapped on the on his telly and he played rhythm against Slick, mm. it, it just became more, more, what's the word? Uh, uh, you, uh, not, uh, authentic. Let's put it that way. There was, it was, so it became not so much a front man thing, whereas Jeffrey, I was a bona fide, just a front man, you know. But um, but when the guitar went on, then all of a sudden it seemed to, at least for a year or some of them anyway, it, it balanced the thing out to where it was like, that's what the band's really all about. And one good reason was a tune that started off with me and just my guitar, very quietly. And then the and then the band would come in, but we didn't cut it that way on the record. On the record, it just came right in. Ding 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 ding. ding. Whereas I would be able to milk it live, just my guitar, me, and then the band would kick in, and the audience loved it. And uh, Hammer to the Heart was a was a was a big one. Yeah, I like that live. too. That was a big one live, but it was cut atrociously it was cut terribly but that was after slick and i wrote that after the fact it was kind of a one of the later ones we wrote you know and um one we knew we were stuck with Bo. you know but that was that one was a big the audience took that one too germany was just you know yeah david how, how difficult was it to do press and sell the record knowing that you didn't like the sound of it at all? Well, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I mean, when you're out there and somebody's sticking a mic in front of you and, you know, they're there because they want, they, they find importance in you, Be you know, or they wouldn't be there. They find importance in you. You, you, you know, your mindset kind of goes into a different gear, and you know you don't you're not going to sit there and just start saying, "Oh, really? You really dug that? We thought it was a pile of shit." You know, you're not thinking yeah. that way. You're just you're thinking, "I want to please this guy. I want to this gal, and I want, I want them to walk away feeling good about it." You know, and uh, so it, it was it was it, the whole European thing was so bizarre, and that's what I was going to get at, allude to earlier with him with. Jeffrey, who charted and were there on the second record, they sent us to Japan. They never sent us to Europe or anywhere else. Okay? So Dirty White Boy gets to fucking England. And, and everywhere, for that matter. And every place we went, we would go for a walk, and you know, because you wanted to walk around these, these mystery streets and stuff, and you'd come across a record store. And we were in that town to play. All the displays in the front of the record stores were both Jafria records and sometimes behind the Jafria records were the Dirty White Boy record. Was the Dirty White Boy. And Slick would look at me and he'd go, you motherfucker. He goes, you telling me you think you never played here? And I said, Slick is God is my witness. We never, they never sent us here. And he goes, well, why the fuck is every record store touting the Jafria records? And I go, I don't know. 
I don't know. And every time we do it, you know, we try to get back on the bus, you know, be crowds out there. Two thirds of them were Jeffrey offense. And there'd be, you know, I'd be signing jackets, albums, this, that, and the other. And suddenly we're going, this is insane. What is going on? What is going on? So he was really, and, you know, I don't think he'd mind me saying this because it's, it's his truth. You know, this was the first time Slick went on tour, on a major tour, let's just call it a semi-major tour, sober, dead, stone cold sober. So he was, there was a part of him that was scared shitless. And he was, you know, he's about as pro as you can get. Hmm. And he's been, I, I, God bless him, he's been sober since 1988. I mean, he won't eat a piece of food that's got boiled off vodka, you know, or boiled off anything like that. He, I mean, he is just stone cold sober. Yeah. And that's since 88. But that tour was, was his cherry breaker, you know, uh, as far as playing live. I mean, he used to, the stories were horror stories. You know, roadies would have to find him in a bathroom, strap his, he'd be throwing up in the sink, and he wouldn't know where he was, and they'd have to strap his guitar on him, and, and two guys would have to walk him down the staircase to get him onto the stage. And once he got in front of his two lousy little pedals, he'd just go on autopilot. You know, <laughs> but that's how bad he was. Yeah, That's how bad things were getting for him. You know, he OD'd on NyQuil. You know, they had to take him to Roosevelt Hospital in New York, you know, like in back in 87 or something like that. He was going to die. He says, if I touch that any any shit anymore, he says, I'm dead. I'm dead. Wow. So, yeah. No, David. So it's a testament to him. That tour, I, I'm not going to keep you long more. Everybody out there, you metalheads, this is Minute from a Tear from Steelheart. You are listening to. Focus on metal, rock and roll. Uh, that tour was in Magnum, wasn't it? In England, yeah, um, yeah. Magnum was for the most part. Was, we were, I think, we we're up pretty much at the time with them. Mm. I think you they know, were they were on okay. the same label on Polydor. Um, yeah, um, it was Polydor. You're I, right. It yeah, I don't know whether you're aware. They had an in, they had an interesting uh, time with the label as well on that record because. They, that, the record they did was Good Night LA with Keith Olsen and the label made him get outside songwriters in to break the American market and they never actually released the album in the US that makes sense <laughs> it's, it's typical bullshit it's typical label bullshit yeah. you know um, I remember being in Scotland I can't remember his name most of them are really nice fellas but the singer Bob Catley. I can't remember his name Bob Catley what's his first name Bob Catley Bob, Bob Catley, yeah. that's right. He and I, I remember, it was the only time throughout everything, he and I got sent to a radio station in Scotland to do a, an interview together. And I don't think he liked me at all. And I can pick up a vibe pretty quick. So I basically just kind of sat next to him, but I basically just made just made the DJ laugh, you know which I don't think Bob liked at all. I was just joking and having a good time. And he was just sitting there very morosely and I didn't get along. We didn't, we didn't go out of our way to talk or anything like that. Whereas Lou Graham, Lou, you know, he, he was, we, he and I would eat with the crew. That's the kind of guy Lou is. Mm. He and I would, we would eat with the crew. And then, you know, he used us as his barometer as to how the audience was. Because Foreigner, we used to call them, after after about two weeks of hearing hit after hit after hit after hit, and then watching absolutely nothing going on on stage, we used to call them Boringer. And we did, and it wasn't because we didn't like them. It was just because they didn't do anything. It was just, there was no entertainment value other than them being on stage and just playing their songs, you know. So for an audience, one night at a time, it was fantastic. And Lou knew it. So when I was coming off stage, soaking wet, he would stick his head either out of the dressing room or out of the crew room, and he'd look at me with those big blue eyes, those big bug eyes, 
he look at me and he either give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down with this big question mark on his on his face and i just go thumbs up and he go yeah and i guess i go if i went thumbs down he knew he was going to have to be working hard and you know and try to get the audience to friggin budge you know so uh it was uh it was very interesting, you know, the, 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 and then he took us the, the night before the last gig, he took us all like at 11 o'clock at night. He had his favorite Italian restaurant in Rochester stay open and he took both bands and everybody, the crib, everybody to a big dinner. Nice. And me and Rick, Rick Wills got into a, you know, their old bass player yeah. got into a, got into a bread roll fight, throwing shit all over the <laughs> restaurant, just had a blast having a ball. And Mick was like, Mick didn't like me either. You know, Mitt's a very arrogant, arrogant cat. Bud Prager was married, managing them at the time. And Bud wanted, to, in fact, Bud took me for, for a while as a solo. He took me for a while after, after the four, in between all of that nonsense. You know, he wanted, he wanted to manage me as, as a solo artist. But he, he ended up just being up and, you know, Montauk Bay or wherever the Montauk he did in Montauk and I would never hear from him and he had some slouch that worked here on the west coast in LA you know and I'd meet with this guy in his crummy little apartment or uh, office occasionally and I'd go anything new from from Bud that was when um, and Virgin was interested in taking me as a solo and uh, that was when Bud was involved with me and that was short lived you know, just it just the guy the guy who from Virgin broke his broke his leg like in a thousand pieces on a motorcycle accident, and it is and he was out of commission, and Bud and I just kind of like just, just drifted apart, but Bud was really really uh, you know interested at one point, and I think the one point came. And I'll give you this is a funny story too. They played. Because they didn't move. So people in the back really couldn't see anything. So what they did is they played on a slanted stage. That was So in other words, people in the back could see the whole band. Hmm. It was like the band was playing sideways, you know, <laughs> so like, like in the air. So me running around all over the place. You know, I would get, I would get, like, you might as well just throw me in a pool and then put me on a stage. I was, you know, from one end of the stage to the other for 90 minutes, you know, for an hour, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And there was one night we were somewhere, I don't know, we were not Philadelphia, we were, it was a big, big arena. And uh, so there was a whole, you know, the, the pit on the wings, you know, where people, you know, VIPs could be and watch the band and all that stuff. I came, and this is what I think I hooked, but I was running towards across the stage from stage right to stage left heading towards that loge up there and i was running towards them and i used to play baseball you know like serious pro with the, with the giants and i went into a slide now this was a tipped stage <laughs> so so i hit the stage high and i slid down but I kept going. <laughs> I couldn't stop because they didn't have, they didn't use side fills. They all, they flew their monitors out in front of them up high. They didn't have any side fills to stop me. So I'm, I'm sliding and I can't, but there's no brakes and I keep going. I keep going. And there's Bud, a couple other people and Martha Quinn, little Martha from MTV. And I flew right off the stage and thank God there were some road cases down like two feet down below me. And I landed on those road cases, pronounced to me, uh, my feet hit something and I landed and just raised my arms to the, to the left hand loads, you know, like, yeah, I planned that whole thing, you know, and they, <laughs> they went nuclear and Bud just was in tears. Martha was terrified. She thought I was going to fly right into her head. You know, she, she was like a little kid, like Little Red Riding Hood running yeah. away from the wolf. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and Bud, Bud was just, he was, and then he came back and said hello and introduced himself and all that. And he said, that was insane. I said, thank God those road cases were there. I'd been frigging, 
doing the next show in a wheelchair, you know. <laughs> David, did, uh, <laughs> so, did, did you get a chance to hang out much with the Deep Purple guys? There's an odd bunch, boy. Now, that was the original, but the real band. Yeah. Ian Pace, just a sweetheart, just a great freaking human being. He hung out with us. He was this, that, and the other, and blah, blah. Richie, I'm going right to Richie. I don't care because I'm not the only person who will go, after, go, go for his throat. That guy is the biggest asshole that had ever strapped on a guitar or got on a stage because Goldie was smoking him every night. Goldie was doing shit that Richie had no clue how, how to do. And uh, we were in Philadelphia and, 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 and just to shorten the, the story, Dylan was basically Richie's at that time, 85 perfect strangers. He was basically Richie's, you know, yes man, Gillen, as great as Gillen is, he was like his yes man. He just basically didn't want to have anything to do with getting in a fight or this or that or anything like that. Glover uh, never said a word to any of us. John was uh, the first night in Wichita. He came backstage after our set, you know, because it was all it was um, free. It was um, open seating. There was no seats. It was just a big, you know, mosh pit. And and they, you know, you got to remember when we when they signed us on, they signed us on based a charting call of the heart. That's you know, a Journey slash Eagles band to open up for them, or probably the other way around, probably an Eagles slash Journey band. And we blew the part, blew the place apart. And John came downstairs, he came in right into the dressing room, knocked politely, opened the door. We said, John Lord, oh my God, you know, this is he's going, man, welcome to the tour. You guys are fucking fabulous. It was incredible. It was just that, blah, blah, blah. So that, that night, we all just proceeded to get wrecked. We were so ecstatically happy <laughs> and things like that. I get about 2.30 in the morning in Texas, Odessa, Texas, you know, stunk like oil wells. And uh, it's our manager, one of our managers. And he's saying, Dave, we got problems. It might have been three in the morning. And I said, you know, I'm like, well, what, what, what are you talking about? I went, great. John Lord came down, blah, blah, blah. He says, Richie wants to fire you guys today, tonight, tomorrow. Like, you're not going to show up. And we said, what are you talking about? And he said, Richie wants you guys off the tour. He doesn't want to deal with you guys. And I said, what the, fuck, what the fuck for? This is my first major tour. I'm going, what the fuck for? And then it spread through our whole camp. And it was like, he wants what? And then the management said, L listen, you know, they got to uh, Bruce, whatever his name is, who was their manager. Bruce Payne. Said, you can't. Yeah, Payne. Yeah, I remember what he looked like. I knew his name was Bruce. And Bruce wanted him off, wanted us off too. And they, they basically just said, listen, you can't fire him. You have to pay him off, you know, if you want to try to fire him. So what they did, let's say the ticket time for the show was 7.30 or 8 o'clock. If it was an 8 o'clock show, Purple would make us go on at like 20 to 8. They'd give us half, not even half of the house lights. They took our side fills away, no monitors. They took, I had three monitors in front of me on the floor. They took two of them away and they left me one, one wedge that was probably two and a half feet wide. Okay. So I couldn't, I couldn't hear a damn thing. And this went on throughout the whole tour till we got to Philadelphia. And Goldie and I were, and the manager, one of our managers, were on our way from the hotel to the spectrum. And we got hit by a, uh, we were over a riverbed up high. And we got hit about 90 miles an hour from the rear. Car almost careened off the bridge. And we were, Goldie and I were like freaked out, just flipped out. You know, manager was totally fucked up. He was riding shotgun. And thank God he had his belt on. We hitchhiked off the turnpike. Some fella in a VW van pulled us, pulled over on the bridge. 
Goldie's got his guitar in his case, and the, Larry's limping. I'm holding him up. The guy, is, God bless him, he put us in the van, and he says, well, where you got what happened? Where are you guys headed? Our car is all to totaled. I got a picture of the car. It's just totaled. We said, we're on our way to the Spectrum. The Spectrum? What are you guys doing in the school of Spectrum? We said, well, we're playing there tonight. We're supposed to be there already. He goes, he goes, well, I can't, I can't go there and get you there. I said, you'll get us there. Don't worry. Just drive. Just drive to the back where the back entrance is. So these people, you know, we get there. These the, the, the security's like going, what the, who the fuck are you? And he says, I've got three of these guys in the band. They're, they're supposed to be playing here tonight. So we show our faces and they go, oh, my God. We're there we're on, on, on the bridge. They're going to feel the brother. They should be dead. You know. <laughs> wow. So we get in. We get into our dressing room. I go through almost a fifth of vodka in 15 minutes. I'm so shook up. Yeah. 20,000 Deep Purple fans out in Philadelphia at the Spectrum. We get out. We start to do our show. Everything is going wrong. Sound is going off here. Goldie's amp is feedbacking like this, that, and the other. Blah, blah, blah. We get to the last song, which was Trouble Again. And... My vocal mic gets cut. I go over to Goldie's vocal mic, which you never use. You just stay for looks. It's been cut. So I grab, I grab Krigger's kick drum mic, <laughs> and I'm ye I'm yelling. I am yelling <laughs> at twenty thousand Deep Purple fans, and I'm prancing up and down the stage, back and forth, back and forth, and I'm yelling, "Somebody's fucking with us!" Somebody's fucking with us. Deep Purple is fucking with us. And I sure as hell, I look back, and Richie's just after I start that rant, he start walk, he's walking off the back of the stage. He was up there manipulating everything. And our roadie, somehow, our monitor guy, or our stage guy, our stage mixer, had been pushed aside and Richie had some guy just totally fucking our mixes up. Just totally fucking everything up. Turning mics off, doing this, that, and the other. But he didn't remember to turn the kick drum mic off. And when I was yelling all this shit at the Deep Purple fans, they were, they went nuts. Like, positive. Like, yeah, fuck those guys! Right? So we go back to the dressing room. And I am livid. I am absolutely coming. My eyes are popping out of my head and I'm back there. And I'm so fucking mad. And I said, if Brooksy, Brooksy was their big fucking security bouncer, big curly haired blonde guy, he's twice my size, you know, he comes storming into our dressing room and I shot out of my chair. And I ran up, I ran at him, and I said, you motherfucker, you get your fucking out, you get the fuck out of here, or I will take you apart. I will take you up, and he, his eyes got all glazed, and I mean, I must have just looked like a rabid fucking cat. <laughs> it just, you know, it just jumped at him, you know, or a crazy friggin' monkey, mm. you know, and he just bailed, that was it. So the next night was our last night in Pittsburgh. <laughs> I'll never forget Greg. Our last night in Pittsburgh, band's going to fly back in two days. Greg and I have to fly back right after the gig to do an MTV thing the next day in LA. Band's going to stay, sleep the night, fly in the next. So Greg takes, he takes, he takes a, and they each had their own room, you know, dressing room. He takes two sticks of chapstick and he play he, he, and Purple's on stage now. And we're, we're, he and I are getting ready to leave. And he takes two chapstick. And he opens Gillen's dressing room door. And I think he left a little note like, you know, love Jafria. And he put two tubes of chapstick <laughs> on this table for Ian to look at. Like, in other words, you can kiss that motherfucking guy's ass as long as you want. He's still a fucking asshole, and you're a fucking asshole, you know? And then we left. Never heard from them again. 
ever again. <laughs> it was unbelievable. It was just unbelievable. Pearl Goldie, he's like 20 years old, you know, and he can't control his, his guitar is going like, just going bonkers, you know. And, oh, and that's the, the topper. As, as Greg and I are walking down the hall, we see Goldie's, Richie's dressing room. God bless Goldie at the, at the time. He's just a, you know, his, his idol was Richie. Yeah, he's told me he's that. Got his, he's got his back to us in the hallway. The door is like three quarters open. And he's got his arms around Richie. Richie's got the guitar on. And I went, what the fuck were you doing? He goes, well, I was teaching Richie my, how I do my hammer-ons. <laughs> I go, are you joking? He goes, no. He innocently looked at me and says, no. He just wanted to know how I did certain things. And I said, and you showed him? He said, well, you know, you know the guy's my idol. And I'm going after him, what he did to us last night in Philly? Yeah. I said, and he just went, well, I, I don't know. I didn't. I really didn't know. You know, and I, I just said, okay, never mind. <laughs> and I just left. <laughs> it's a true story. Wow. It's a true story. Yeah. Yeah. I wow. mean, that was just like, like it's unsolvable. You can't, it just, that doesn't happen. You know, so that, that was insane. And, uh, you know, oh, and they shortened our set down from, what, just under an hour? To 25 minutes <laughs> so if anybody came in they were already 20 minutes late so they caught like call to the heart and trouble again what a dick I mean, move they really, that oh is a my real God. dick move it, it's the it's the i mean i've heard a lot of stories about him with rainbow on putting shaving cream in people's shoes and turning the heat up you know, all that kind of crap. You yeah. know, I've heard it from Joe. I've heard it from all those guys. But there was nothing, nothing like what went on with, with us. I mean, I swear to God, you know, it was unbelievable. And I'll never forget that when we first got to Odessa, it was a big, like, like set up, almost like a hockey rink. Because it was like, there was no chairs. Because it was, uh, you know. So Richie got there. I mean, the, the purple guys got there to check out the venue. G Greg and I were there. I think a couple of us were. And we were, Greg and I were in the far corner, like the other end of the arena. Now, Richie's a, he's a, apparently he, at that time, he was a fairly, really good soccer player. Yeah, he loves it. Yeah. And he, yeah. And he, uh, and he lets people know about it too. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> And I was watching him, you know, he had like a black trench coat on, you know, and his hat. And, and he teed off on a soccer ball right towards us. And it was going to, and Greg wasn't paying attention at all. And it was going to clip, it would have clipped Greg in the head. It was a great shot all the way across the rink, and, and it was going to hit him in the head. And I, I deflected the ball off you know, off to the side. And Greg went, what the fuck was that? I said, I said, Richie, I said, he teed off on a soccer ball was going to hit you in the head. And he goes, that fucking asshole. He goes, that <laughs> fucking asshole. I said, well, you know him better than I do. I've never met him, you know? And, uh, that's how, that's, how, that was the tone. That's how the tone was with that soccer ball. And then when we blew the place apart and he realized that he had hired a rock and roll band, it was like, he said, no, these guys aren't staying. They're gone. Get girls, call girls school or whatever they're called. You know, get, get, get them on. Because they ended up taking over for us. Because we jumped onto the foreigner tour. You know, after the purple tour, we jumped right onto, right onto the foreigner tour. And, um, and that was like just going to heaven. Other, other than having to deal with Nick and his, you know, his just his just arrogant, you know, nose in the air like I'm Paul McCartney, you know, and it was like, oh God, this this guy's, you know, he writes some great songs. I mean, they're good, you know, commercial radio songs. Dude, say hello to somebody once in a while. Don't just nod your head like, like you're, you know, you're the wonderful world of Oz. You know, it was horrible. And I've ran into Lou a couple of times over the years, you know, and it was always, it's always been, you know, 
always been just a laugh and oh my god you remember that and oh shit you know i remember them leaving he and mick were, we had a few days off we were going to play a couple little clubs and they had three days off and they went lou and uh and mick flew to go out and see the firm and i went oh you're gonna go out and see the firm you're gonna go out and see rogers and Lou is like all lit up and he's going, yeah, man, I'm going to see the man. I'm going to see the fucking man. You know, and I swear to God, this I would talk like a kid. He's going, I'm going to see the man. So a couple of days later, they, you know, they come back for the next, you know, they return. And I go, I go right to Lou. And I go, so how was he? How was it? You know, how was he? And he, he just smiled. He just went, the shit, man. Shit! <laughs> it was so cool. It was just a great, a great moment. And then I've run into a couple of times in studios, you know, around here, you know, in LA. Mm. And he, it's always been real, you know. And I felt so bad, man, when I found out about his, you know, the surgery and all that shit. But he made, he got through it, you know. Yeah. And, and just to, just to make sure, you know misinterpret anything i tip my hat to kelly and that whole thing and keeping him going because i know kelly you know and he's he's a great singer he is. and he's had a great career he, he turned it into a great career for him for himself you know and uh you know so as far as foreigner no qualms other than just nick not being a very likable fella mm. but now you know it's like all of us you know your mortality starts to set in and it's like uh you know, who have I been an asshole to over the years? That starts coming to the forefront of your head, <laughs> you know. Thankfully for me, I don't have anybody coming to the forefront of my head. I've never really messed with anybody. I've always been very calm and cool and, you know, respectful. And if somebody got, got me pissed, I'd let them know it, you know. But, mm. but I'd have to really be pushed. <laughs> like on that purple thing in Philadelphia, I was pushed to the limit. Well, the, the, well, David, yeah. the way to look at that is, it, after that, it can only get better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at my age. <laughs> so, fi final, que yeah, yeah. Fi final question for me. Big hit the geriatric ward. Yeah, final what? question for me, and I'm sure I already know the answer to this. Uh, when is the last time you listened to the Dirty White Boy in full? Well, you know what? And I'll try to, uh, there's a company, you know, there's all these stupid companies that show up. There's a company called Bad, oddly enough, Bad Reputation Records out of France. Okay, I think it was them or somebody else. Is Rock, anyway, is Rock somebody, did a whole, in somebody did a whole re-release of the Dirty White Boy album mm -hmm. over in Europe. The whole thing. They sent me like two boxes of them, you know, and I'm thinking... Well, this is wonderful. You know, I'm not going to see a penny out of this shit. Not that I care, but, you know, but, you know, it's like, hey, could you sign one and send it back to me? And I was saying, hey, listen, France or wherever the hell you are, you want to pay the postage? I'm not paying it. You know, <laughs> give me a break. <laughs> You're going to be keeping all the money. Yeah. You know, Christ. <laughs> you know, so I never sent that guy anything, you know, but um, uh, what did you ask me? Um, when is the last time you listened to the whole record? Oh, oh, oh the whole thing in together a, a long time ago. But in my studio, I have, I have, um, you know, I have, like I said, that I have some of the demos. I have some of the, the uh, some of the Bow Hill first mixes, which are interesting in themselves because I did all the string parts and both taunts himself as, as being a keyboard player, that he was a keyboard player. And I said, Bo, Bo, why don't you play keyboards on this stuff? And he go, oh, no, 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 no. You play keys? And I said, yeah, man, yeah I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a hacker. I can I can get through it. I, everything I've ever done on my solo shit, everything. I've done all the keys. He's just, you know, you just play keys. So there's some interesting stuff on there only because he favored the keyboard stuff. So I would listen to it and go, ah, that's kind of interesting, you know. But as a whole, the actual record, I've never sat down and listened to it for quite some time. You know, it, you know. again, a song here, a song there. I think I've gravitated to, like, soul, mm. listen to that. And gravitated to You Give Me Love, and there's, like, 
two titles on that one. You gave me love and the ballad. Um, that one and um, Badlands. Because I have, I have the two, you know, comparison ones. I have the John mixes of those, of that one, and I have the, uh, the John mix of, uh, of Badlands. Which just, I mean, they just, they incriminate the record. <laughs> so, so we didn't really know what we sounded like, really, until we got out live and yeah. the roadies were recording us backstage on a cassette machine. And we were going, who, who the fuck is that? <laughs> and Kenny's going, it's us, dude. It's us. And we're going, no, there's no way. He goes, yeah, yes. Well, Steve was one of our roadies. He was recording those shows. And I'm like going, oh my God. So Kenny's got like, you know, he's got two albums worth of live Dirty White Boy. But it's, you know, it's gone. He's, he's, yeah. he's passed, yeah. passed away. You know? So so David, it took, it, it's been a pleasure talking to you for giving me all this time. Um, I'm sorry to talk your ear off. No, no, I, I, you, that, that, that's fine with me. I, I, like to, I like to hear all the stories and you, you told a lot of really good ones. Um, do you do you have um do you have a website or anything there that you want to that you want to give out that people can get in touch with you or maybe buy stuff? No, you know I haven't. I've, I've got a. Web, I mean, if you go to davidglennarsley.com, I think my picture still comes up. You know, and uh, but I I don't I don't service it at all. I don't at this point. You know, I can post it on my Facebook like, hey, I'm putting it, and I'm going to. I've got I've got probably about fifteen tunes that have nothing to do other than two of them. Nothing to do with rock and roll or Jafria sound or Dirty White Boy sound. They're just very personal songs to me that I want I want to get them out. I want to just purge myself of them, you know what I mean? I don't care if 10 people pick them up. I just want them. I want to know I got rid of them. I got them out of, uh, off of my, out of my Pro Tools and, you know, and into somebody's hands if they want them. And and there's a few really, really, uh, really cool sweet tunes on them. And I say sweet in a very, you know, they're meaningful. They're, they're very meaningful to me. And I don't. And so they'll come out. They'll come out eventually. You know, nice. I, in what format? I have no idea. Nice. <laughs> it was great talking to you, David. It's been a pl- listen. Thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. Okay, man. And just go ahead and turn like in everything I said. Just change it. Okay. Change everything. I will. So it'll really piss me off, and I have to have another thing to aggravate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, David. Well, thanks for talking. And if you need me. a nice picture of me in a tutu, I'll send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, All right. have a good DG rest. now. <laughs> yeah. I'll have a- yeah. Present day. Okay. All right, David. Have a good rest of the night. Take care, pal. All right. Bye. All right. Well, this is usually the part of the show where I tell you to uh, go to the, all of the guest artists, social media sites, and all that good stuff. But as you just heard, David doesn't really do any of that. So I really can't do that. What I would say is that uh, just keep half an eyeball on his Facebook stuff. See when he decides to post any of those songs he was talking about. And uh, maybe there'll be something in there that you like. He certainly seems to be fond of them. But uh, thanks to David for taking a crap load of time. You know, you guys only heard, you know, about 90 minutes worth of Richie's chat with David. But in truth, the actual talk went probably about two hours. It might even been a little bit more than that. So hopefully you enjoyed everything you heard on this episode. Thank you once again for listening. And as I said way back at the beginning, for some of you, for continuing to listen for well over a decade now. It's kind of bizarre when I look back and think about that. But, uh, yeah, we, you know, we started back before people even really understood what the fuck a podcast was. And here we are still doing it. Maybe not syndicated anymore because we pull back from all of those deals. And maybe not weekly. And that's just because, uh, well, things get in the way and uh, you get some burnout and all that good stuff. You want to keep enjoying what you're doing and making sure that uh, people are enjoying what you're doing as well. And speaking of enjoying, just want to toss this one out as well as over the last week or so, I have really been enjoying the shit out of Wolfgang Van Halen's two releases, both Mammoth and and, uh, Mammoth 2. Great stuff. I think I prefer the first one a little bit more 
has a little bit more rock value to it, even though the second one has got some really killer, killer solos. And there's a few songs on there that even remind me a little bit of uh, Alter Bridge. But uh, they are great releases. So if you haven't given Mammoth a chance, definitely would say to do that. And I am certainly looking forward to uh, talking with Wolfgang potentially coming up in November and uh, checking him out live in Boston. But again, if you haven't listened to those yet, I, I recommend that. Again, I kind of swing towards the first one more than the second one. But they are actually both pretty damn good releases Lots of good musicianship on there, on display. And also, while we're talking about new music, let's talk about a little bit of new old music. Another one you might want to go check out, pick up, is the new release from Whitesnake. It's a reissue of the Purple Album, and it does have our buddy Joel Hoekstra laying down some mean-ass guitar on there. So if you want to revisit that album Go check that out. Make sure you do it early enough that you can get yourself one of the gold editions. But anyways, for this week, that's it. There ain't no more. Stick a fork in it. This puppy is done. So for Richie, myself, and everybody else here at Focus on Metal, have yourselves a great metal week. And until we talk to you again next time, remember... Focus on Metal! Everything else is insignificant. Still here? It's over. Go home.